Yesterday I talked about script execution control and I ended the, the talk with, well, some things that could improve kernel security. And the, today's talk, the talk is about um, Hyperzone enforced kernel integrity for Linux with KVM. So, um, this, well, the kernel is not perfect and there's still a lot of issues, a lot of bugs, and uh, potentially um, also a lot of uh, exploits against the kernel. And that can be leveraged by attackers to, um, well, get some arbitrary read or write to the kernel and then, well, bypass everything. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, to be able to enforce integrity on the kernel. Um, so here integrity I define it by uh, being able to guarantee well, uh, critical parts of the kernel uh, to be protected. Um, well, there's a lot of potential issues, uh, known and unknown, and yeah, we like to protect against uh, that. So the trend model. <coughs> uh, let's say, let's say the attacker is able to use an exploit to gain uh, after read and write um, to the kernel. And here we're talking about the, a gas kernel. So um, mainly the host is the virtual machine that is in charge of uh, managing other virtual machines, in the case of uh, KVM. Uh, guest virtual machines are what we are commonly call virtual machines. So it's uh, when you spawn something and uh, you can play with it. Um, so here we're trying to protect guest feature machines. Um, so the third model is, um, well, the attacker could, in some way, be able to, uh, um, well, through user space processes, uh, even network packets, or even malicious uh, block devices, to be able to um, attack the kernel and to uh, yeah, exploit a, a bug. Um, what we like to do here is to use virtualization and especially hardware-based virtualization. Um, there's currently a lot of different protections on the kernel to protect itself against such kind of attack, but, um, well, it is a self-protection, so once you have enough uh, power to change or to disable such protections, well, you can bypass them. These are good things to have, but we can improve that. And for that, we need to rely on something which can have um, more privileges than the kernel itself uh, to be able to protect uh, from, to be protected from the kernel, a gas kernel, than the hypervisor. So there's a lot of different hardening mechanism um, that I use, that can be used, um, so there's uh, let's say self rotation mechanism like uh, JSTKD, Parks, and OpenBSD is using a lot too. Uh, Linux, um, well, kind of uh, improve uh, his states um, uh, with different mechanism too. Um, Windows is using, is using what we call uh, virtualization based security, VBS, and uh, this is a set of mechanism that enable to protect uh, a Windows uh, operating system uh, from an integrity point of view and even to, well, protect some secrets. Uh, for Android, there's, uh, well, Samsung, Samsung uh, AKP and uh, the YY hypervisor that can do kind of the same things to protect an Android uh, smartphone. Um, well, iOS, iPhones use similar techniques and they uh, develop uh, one version, watch, uh, watch tour, and then uh, improve it um, with some hardware uh, mechanisms. For Linux, uh, there's also a virtualization based security. Um, so mainly, um, Bitdefender's hypervisor memory introspection um, is used, well, can be used to protect a guest kernel, uh, but also to introspect it. So that might be useful for uh, debugging, developing, or even, um, well, analyzing uh, attacks. 
Um, Intel does also release a proof of concept um, with some mechanism, uh, leveraging virtualization. Um, and in this talk, I will explain what we did and um, until which point and what we can do to protect a, a gas kernel. Uh, so for this, we took a look at different patches which were submitted some time ago. Uh, mainly the KVM um, patch series, uh, which was like 30 or 40 patches. Um, but also the parameterization uh, control register pinning patch series and uh, the IPSO based integrity, uh, which was presented uh, some years ago. Uh, but yeah. Well, last one doesn't really, uh, well, there's no public code, uh, at least only some part of the code. So, uh, yeah, nothing really uh, for Linux yet. So that was uh, our goal. And for this, we wanted to use KVM. So KVM is a de facto uh, Linux hypervisor. Um, there's mostly two parts. One is the hypervisor itself, and the other part is um, the guest um, drivers, which might be used to, um, well, um, have improved virtualization. Um, KVM kind of leverages Linux mechanism, uh, well, Linux kernel code, to like the scheduling and resource limitation. And, uh, well, you can create, spawn, and manage virtual machines uh, thanks to uh, what we call a virtual um, machine monitor, uh, which can be, uh, for instance, QMU or Cloud Hypervisor. So this is a use-based program uh, running in the host uh, part. Okay, um, a word about chain of trust. So here we would like to enforce integrity, um, but a bit more than that. Um, so we need to rely on some stuff, some basis, and so the idea is to rely on, well, to have some something to trust uh, as a basis. Um, so for this, uh, we can rely on, uh, for instance, Secure Boot, which can be used to give some trust to the base, uh, mainly the virtual machine monitor and the hypervisor. Once this host is ready, it can launch a new virtual machine. So in this case, a guest kernel and guest use space, guest applications. And well, the rule of a kernel is to manage a user space, to create processes and so on. And the goal of this kernel is, well, also to protect such processes. There's a lot of stuff in Linux to enforce access control. And uh, even the basic stuff like uh, virtual memory management uh, it's useful to kind of isolate and protect uh, applications. So the idea is to rely on the hypervisor to enforce restriction on the guest kernel, and then the guest kernel, as usual, can enforce restriction on applications. So um, what we like to have is to let users manage their own kernels. Uh, we don't want to enforce anything or to, well, require uh, some stuff that the users might not have, or code, or external code, and so on. And uh, yeah, we want them to have the same control as they have currently with kernel self, self protection mechanisms. Um, and well, if we want this feature to be usable, we want it to be simple. And well, with almost no configuration. From a security point of view, uh, well, we need to realize something, as I, I just explained before, uh, mainly. Um, well, secure and trusted hypervisor and virtual um, machine monitor. Um, the security policies we like to enforce are mainly two or three. Um, simplest one is to enforce control register pinning. So it's a simple hardening mechanism uh, which can be used to restrict uh, the use of hardware capabilities um, that should not be usable once a kernel is Boot it. So that might be uh, leveraged, for instance, by an attacker to, uh, well, disable the write permission that could then enable to write to any part of the memory. 
and also some similar mechanisms like SMEP and SMAP. Um, the second part is to enforce restrictions on the kernel memory. So um, for the kernel data, we want it to be set readily, which is already the case, but we want to enforce that from the hypervisor point of view. So this includes syscall table, certificates, keys, security configuration, and a lot of stuff. We also like to enforce a global um, execute the um, right uh, kernel memory policy, or commonly uh, called write or execute. Um, so this means that uh, we like only some little bit kernel memory pages to be executable, but to deny everything else. I mean, from the kernel uh, part. But uh, we also need to run new space, so that, that needs to be handled as well. This watch series is, uh, well, contain two parts. The first one is a common guest kernel API, and the second one is a KVM implementation. Um, so what you like to have here is um, to let the guest be the machine, the guest kernel configure itself, let, like it's, it is already done with different uh, kernel self rotation mechanisms, and to not rely on a specific hypervisor to enforce that. The first implementation is KVM, but we like to have more implementations. Um, well, we need to, of course, rely on the hypervisor in some way. Um, and, well, that might be useful to also get some uh, attack signals and to, uh, to give them or to make them available to uh, the virtual machine monitor in a way that it could be logged and uh, that, that could be then, uh, well, uh, used to inform the user that it's an ongoing attack or stuff like that. Um, so the idea is um, to have a common layer uh, normalized, and this API should be able to be simple to use to enforce, um, well, to tie kernel memory pages to, um, well, protections, memory protections. Well, we don't rely, we don't need to rely on hypervisor implementations, or we don't want to. And uh, last but not least, uh, well, there's some tests, and we want them to be, well, usable by any hypervisor implementation. In general, the guest API looks like this. It's pretty simple. Um, so, as we can see uh, at the bottom here. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, here, better. Um, there's mainly two functions, um, protect ranges and lock zeros. And protect, protect ranges takes, uh, well, mainly one argument, but it's uh, split in, in two, it's a pointer and uh, a size, a number of elements. And, well, this point to an array that identifies a set of uh, virtual address, well, um, kernel address ranges. So, uh, well, this first virtual address uh, definitions, and then this need to be translated to physical address ones. So that's why you can see here, virtual address range, and physical address range here. And then we can tie these um, memory page ranges to a set of attributes, and here, okay, uh, it will be uh, protections. And the two protections that we define are the no write and the exec permission. The second helper, the log CRS, is to, well, pin control registers. So, pretty simple to use. Um, so, I talk a bit about the boot process, and here I want to highlight some part of the guest scan. So, it's really a summary, very simple. Um, but the important points are when the kernel is initializing itself, uh, there's a first call to the AKI early init, uh, which is in charge uh, of configuring kernel sections and to map kernel sections to uh, memory permissions. Well, then 
it's not part of this part series, but it's uh, relevant. There's a mark read only uh, call, which is in, char in charge to enforce the kernel self protection mechanisms, uh, especially to enforce uh, well, mem um, memory management unit protections. And then, just before launching the initial process, uh, there's a hickey late, hickey late, late init call, which then enforce restriction on uh, memory protection from uh, the part which is man managed by the hypervisor. Uh, so I will explain the EPT part later. And then once everything is set up, once everything is locked, we can launch use space that could in some way maybe compromise the kernel. Let's talk about the KVM implementation. Um, so as I explained, uh, there's mainly two parts. Uh, and for this, well, I, uh, I implemented two hypercodes. Uh, first one to enforce kernel memory jurisdiction, and the second one to uh, be able to uh, pin control registers. And yeah, the underlying ID is to only be able to enforce more and more restrictions and not to unlock them. For the control register pinning hypercall, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, it looks, well, it's quite close to the um, guest API. Uh, there's a new hypercall ID, logs here update. And then two arguments. The first one is to identify the control register, in this case, uh, CR0. And the second argument is to identify a flag that we want to pin, which means uh, that should not be updatable by the guest kernel after that. The second hypercall is to enforce memory page, page ranges protections. Uh, so this relies on EPT, um, that we'll explain just later, just after. Um, for this, we need to rely VMCS, which is a virtual machine control um, um, config configuration, uh, a configuration register for hardware virtualization. And um, yeah, the idea after that is for the hypervisor to log uh, violation items and potentially to forward it to something, uh, to a secure log or something. And um, as it is the case for common memory management permissions. Once um, uh, a fault is detected, uh, well, we need to create a page fault. In this case, it would be created by the IPSO itself and forward it to the guest scanner. So what is EPT? Well, in fact, here we're talking about the, what we call second layer address uh, translation, uh, SLAT, or also called two-dimensional paging, TDP. Um, and well, for Intel, it's called EPT, and for AMD, it's called LVI or NPT, depends. But um, what is really interesting here is that it is a second layer of permission. So the first layer is controlled by the guest kernel itself um, with MMU. But this second layer enables to enforce kind of the same restrictions, but um, by the IPSO itself. And this kind of restriction are not directly available to the guest kernel, otherwise it will be useless. Okay, and so they need to rely on that to enforce uh, the restriction that the guest kernel wants uh, to be enforced on itself. But there is some issue. Um, well, common memory predictions are mainly two, uh, three. There's uh, read prediction, write prediction, and execute prediction or permission. And the issue is, well, um, with a common kernel, there's kernel space and use space. So there's two kinds of um, memory. And well, if we can only enforce uh, one kind of permission on use space and kernel space at the same time, um, well, that might limit us. Um, because that means that we'll need to enforce restrictions on all running code, so the kernel and all your space uh, processes at the same time. And that is really difficult because, well, there's a lot of different use space uh, code, application processes, and so on. But here come handback. Mode-based execution control. So um, it is an Intel mechanism which can say, well, there's a kind of a something similar for AMD, 
but here uh, we only worked uh, and leveraged this mechanism. Uh, the idea is to split the execute bit permission into two permissions, either the kernel bound execu execution or the user mode execution. And that's really interesting because it's enabled to, well, enforce uh, like a deny by default security policy on all the execution, uh, the kernel execution pages, but to not touch and to not care uh, about user space, which should be uh, restricted by the kernel itself, by the guest kernel itself. So how does it lo look like? Um, so here is a um, kind of um, summary of the kernel memory. Well, the whole physical, the whole guest physical memory, um, which is available. But here, we only talk about, we are only talking about the uh, kernel memory permissions. So you can see, well, there's mainly two, well, mainly two sections: the text section of the kernel and the read-only data section. But the thing is, if we don't have a back. Uh, well, some part of this read-only data kernel section must be executable. Because in, in fact, uh, this read-only data section contains your space code, uh, in this case, uh, VDSO, which is mapped to your space processes and then used by them. So if we deny execution on this part, well, your space processes will not work well at all. And here come Another thing is that, well, every new memory that can be used by user space must be, well, should be executable, executable in some way. Otherwise, you will not be able to run code, user space code. And so this means that we cannot enforce restrictions on memory which is not allocated yet. Um, we need to be able to differentiate between kernel execution kernel code and use space code. With MBAC, it's much more easier and cleaner. So we can enforce a read-only data section uh, in a read-only way, but this time again, it is only for the kernel. Um, so the VDSO here will be executable for user space because we, we don't configure that, we don't care about that. And we can enforce uh, read execute permission for the text session of the kernel. But most importantly that we can enforce a deny by default policy for everything else. Uh, everything else should not be executable by the kernel. Okay, let's see some demo. So it's mainly um, well, a code which is part of, the, of uh, an RFC uh, we sent uh, last week. Uh, so I'll give you the links at the end of the talk. So, um, as you can see, um, at the right here, uh, well, I will launch uh, the guest, a guest Vita machine. And at the left, uh, well, it is a host. So we'll see the host log at the top and at the bottom, we'll see the test code, which, we, which will, will be executed at the right. Let's get back to the beginning. Okay, so you can see here, so why, why I, I highlighted at the left, so it's an assembly code that will be executed by the kernel. And the important point is that it is stored in the read-only data section, which is not common. It should be in the text section, but uh, that's to check that read-only data section is not execut executable. And so the code that will be executed is really simple. It just take an integer and increment it. 
Um, OK, the test code here, uh, well, is, well, the guest kernel is still using the kernel self protection. Um, so the first step here is to disable this protection at runtime. And after that, to execute the code. Which is, by the way, uh, not something easy to do, but um, in theory it is doable to disable the kernel self rotation. OK, as a right, I'm launching a virtual machine. Um, so without any process, because we don't care about that. Um, and I'm launching a normal kernel without the A key protection. Okay, so you can see here uh, the test failed. Um, and well, we can see that uh, 3 plus 1 equals 4, so that's good. But what is not good is that this code successfully disabled the kernel self protection and executed a code that should not be executable. So we're doing the same, but this time with Hickey enabled. So what we can see first is that there's a kernel initialization, the guest kernel. Um, so it mainly identify uh, five sections and enforce restriction on them, either the no right restriction or the exact, perm the exact um, yeah, permissions. And at the left, uh, you can see the KVM logs. And well, the request is received. And you can see that um, once it is received, everything, well, all memory which is mapped to the guest kernel um, is set as for the permission. So it is denied action for everything except uh, what is allowed. So as you can see, um, the right, the no right permission is um, an allow list, and the exact permission is a deny list. We can do a deny list for execution because execution is quite well. It's not difficult to enforce because it's no. It's not common to have new executable code, but it is quite common to have new data that you want to update. And once the permission is enforced, well, uh, the hypervisor lock the guest configuration. Um, so at the bottom, you can see that the test, uh, the test, uh, well, kind of failed. Um, we don't see the, the end of the test because uh, the kernel, the guest kernel is, is trying and trying again in a loop um, because there's no kernel page fault handling implementation yet for this kind of um, exceptions, which is kind of uh, uncommon for a guest kernel. But the kernel cannot. And, execute uh, such code. And we can see that. Uh, we can see the kernel virtual address here. And it is here, uh, well, received and blocked uh, by the hypervisor. And the hypervisor create a fetch page fault, which is then sent to the guest. So the guest should uh, receive that. Well, it received it, but it just didn't it for now. So that's really part of uh, future work. OK. Um, now let's see a second demo. So it's uh, much more simple this time. Uh, it's about control register pinning. So you can see the same, the, le the, the test code at the left. Uh, so it's quite straightforward. Uh, the code, well, the kernel test code, let's say the exploit, read the CR4 register. And then uh, we try to remove the SMAP bits. Then the right will launch a new video machine, a guest, a guest which is not protected with a key at first. And we can see, um, well, that the test failed because uh, the guest kernel was able to um, disable and to remove this protection. If we do the same, Test, but this time with a HIKI protection. 
Well, we can see that the test failed. Well, the test succeeded because the attack failed. And you can see at the left that um, KVM hypervisor uh, well, cooked this uh, update and blocked it. So yeah, it's not really fancy um, for a demo, but um, yeah, it's always difficult to to show how it works. Well, there is some limitations. Um, for now, this first IRC will static, only statically enforce permissions. So uh, dynamic kernel module is not allowed, which might be an issue, of course, uh, but that set of features might still be useful uh, if you don't need uh, kernel modules. And well, there is some attack techniques which are out of scope. Uh, for instance, ROP. So there's a written orienting programming. So be able to jump to uh, legitimate executable kernel codes is not restrictable by Hickey because, well, it is not his job. But there's other mechanism that can be leveraged, um, even with um, hardware uh, features. Okay. Um, so what we like to do is to be able to um, handle dynamic code, of course. And for that, we need to rely on something, uh, not only the hypervisor, but something which is less privileged to avoid uh, well, this part of code being exploited. And there's two ways to do it, either to implement that in the virtual machine monitor, so QEMU or cloud hypervisor, or to use a dedicated uh, bodyguard virtual machine, uh, which is what is using uh, Windows VPS, for instance. And we also need to handle, well, can memory being uh, freed to remove uh, such permissions. So that will be much more complex, but still doable. Uh, second important thing is, well, to improve the kind of self protection mechanism, because that is the one that are kind of used or copied um, to the hypervisor. So, um, well, we, we can improve the Hickey intonation by restricting more uh, MSR updates uh, by using the hypervisor manage linear address translations, which is a way to uh, kind of prevent um, MMU changes mainly. Um, we could also use uh, execute only memory for the kernel. But yeah, that's not, well, there's some, uh, some issues there, but that should be possible. Um, and yeah, we like to also enforce this kind of restriction on the KVM host as well. But KVM is not designed for that, so yeah, that might be a big issue. Anyway, we can protect the guest, and that's good. Um, other things to other ideas, is that we can monitor attacks uh, by creating new interface uh, to log such attempts and potentially to react to uh, such attack. And so what is not supported yet is nested virtualization because of the MBEC feature, but that might be possible. And so we like to uh, well support more architectures. So for now it's only the uh, Intel architecture, but AMD should be usable the same way and maybe um Okay, let's wrap up. Um, Hickey, the defense in death mechanism that leverages uh, hardware virtualization and especially the MBEC feature, which is, by the way, also used by Windows for the same purpose. Um, so the RFC we sent last week uh, defined a common API layer and a KVM implementation as well. So it's freely available, you can use it and test it. We, you don't need to update uh, or change Creamy, which is uh, nice. And yeah, it's a new project. We're looking for contributors, so if you're interested, please uh, uh, reach out. Uh, there's a lot, of do, a lot to do. Um, 
for instance, support other hypervisors, to support other architectures, to improve gas kernel support, and also to enhance a uh, virtual machine monitor, so QMU, Cloud hypervisor, and other stuff. Um, you can take a look at this link. There is some uh, well, useful links in these links, and I will post the um, demo and the slides there uh, too. Thank you. I'm curious if you're handling uh, huge page support in the second layer of REST translation. Do you fracture memory? Uh, you know, demote it to 4K pages or something like that if you get a request for for smaller regions, I guess physical addresses? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I need to test that, but that should be doable if it's not the case. Um, so right now, the thing is, the configuration is pretty simple. The kernel just identifies a set of sections and just send the related physical addresses to the hypervisor, and the hypervisor just protects them uh, from the beginning to the end uh, without caring about uh, which kind of memory it is. So. And does all this map cleanly onto existing Hyper-V semantics? Sorry? Does all, does, does all of this that's proposed for Linux as a guest already map cleanly onto what's offered for Hyper-V in the Inverdian environments? Um, what? So uh, you, you're working on new hypervisor support, yeah. right? So that's going to be some change to guest code in Linux yeah. in order to support other hypervisors like Hyper-V. Does Hyper-V already support all of the necessary semantics from the guest to hypervisor interface perspective to implement what's proposed for the Linux's guest? So um, this uh, KVM implementation, um, well, there's also some some stuff going on for IPv. IPv um, uses similar mechanisms, but uh, it definitely doesn't work the same way. Okay. Um, it uses a kind of a sidecar virtual machine to yeah. enforce such restrictions. Um, so it's not the same interface. And that's also one reason why we want to have a common API layer uh, for guests can then to kind of not care about IPv0 information details. Um, but yeah, yeah. Only it is only a KVM implementation. Yeah, you're going, you're going to need some kind of VM API kind of inter yeah. interface abstraction that will yeah. uh, let you do this on Zen or KVM or yeah, Hyper-V or yeah. VMware, right? So yeah, there's um, some backend drivers that can be plugged into um, this common API. So yeah, I'll just put my Microsoft hat on for a second. So yeah, this there is a common layer mentioned in there that is meant to be hypervisor agnostic, and um, as far as possible, the, you know, we want to make sure that um, any any existing hypervisors are supported. Um, and so this is this talks about the the KVM implementation using that. Yeah. So there should not be any limitation to IPv0 to implement that. Um, it's, yeah, it's um, just, well, some hypervisor are not implemented. Uh, in the case of IPv0, well, the IPv0 implements some stuff, but uh, other stuff are implemented elsewhere. Uh, for Xen or other stuff, uh, well, there's new code to add. Any more, any question? Thank you.